Welcome everybody to the Office of Undergraduate Research Education Series. Today's um, presentation is on um, data visualization and research posters. And our speakers are Donna Balucci and Greg Hatch. Uh, today's event is virtual, it's being recorded, so we ask you to mute yourself and turn off your camera to ensure the best experience. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat feature, or you can unmute yourself when invited by the speaker. And this is the QR code to the evaluation form. We hope everybody fills it out. But our Europe and SPUR scholars, in order to receive credit for attending this event, you must um, complete the evaluation form. I will put the link in the chat later on. Now, the mission of the Office of Undergraduate Research is to facilitate and promote undergraduate, student, faculty, collaborative research, and creative works in all disciplines throughout the University of Utah campus. In recognition that excellence requires diversity, we pursue this mission through equitable programming that promotes diverse representation and social justice. We would like to acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. And I will now uh, let today's speakers introduce themselves. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I'm so happy to see all of you in this beautiful summer day. Um, my name is Donna Bellucci, and I'm the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Librarian at the Eccles Health Sciences Library. But before becoming a librarian, um, this is like my third or fourth attempt at a career, um, I was actually a graphic designer. So that is why I'm here to help you out today. Hi, I am Greg Hatch, and I am the Head of Creativity and Innovation Services at the Marriott Library on the main campus. And I am also the library's liaison to the performing arts departments. Prior to becoming a librarian, I was a professional stage manager and a lighting designer. So before we get started today, I first want to know how all of you are doing. And um, to do that, I would love if you are comfortable, drop an emoji in the Zoom chat on how you're feeling today. That way I can kind of see how the room is doing and, and play to that energy. There are so many emojis that I see whenever I ask this question and I'm too scared to ask what they mean. <laughs> All right, it sounds like most, most of you are feeling pretty positive. It's gonna be a three-day weekend, happy Juneteenth. Um, I'm feeling all the cowboy hats in here. Speakers and presenters, you're more than welcome to also put in your emojis. I wanna know how everybody's doing. All right, so it sounds like people are feeling pretty positive. The sun's out, feeling feeling okay right now, feeling inquisitive. I love this. All right, so you're all welcome to use the chat to ask us any questions um, in the middle of when we're talking. You don't necessarily, we will be doing a Q&A at the end as well. Um, and Shelly will actually be monitoring the chat in case any of those questions come in and we don't catch it right away. So to get started, what we're talking about when we're talking about your research posters is we're talking about visual communication. So what visual communication is, is being able to take the most important parts of your information and create a way to bring that information to an audience in a way that is creative and graphic and interesting. So when you're creating your research posters, think of them kind of like infographics. Infographics are those things that you see on socials all the time where it is like really cool colors, maybe an icon or a photo, and then some words teaching you something, right? 
And so when you're creating this, the most important thing is your information. It's not the font, it's not the colors, it's what the information you have that you wanna present. And then visual communication is just organizing that information. And you just wanna make sure that it does three things, right? So that it's easily read, it's easily comprehended, and then it's easily retained. So what I like to say is think of your graphic like a billboard, all right? So how many of you saw the Weezer billboard when that went up in South Salt Lake? I'm assuming a lot of you did. A lot of us did, right? And so it was easily read. Yeah, it was just white on black, Comic Sans, Weezer, easy to read, easily comprehended, right? So you drove by, you looked at it, you're like, Weezer, that's a band. I see that. Easily retained. It was really memorable. All of us remember seeing the Weezer billboard, right? So it was a successful billboard. Um, so that is a way to think about what you're doing when you're creating your research poster, right? So the main thing that you always want to do is keep in mind how another person's brain is going to be looking at and interpreting your information. So here's just a great example, right? This was a infographic that was created by University of Utah Health, the area in which I work, right? That was um, trying to help people drink more water. So if you look on the right hand of your screen, you're gonna see all the text, right? And so here's all the information, it's right here. But then look how much more interesting it is when it's created graphically, right? Um, if, you, if you feel like it in the chat, feel free. Let me know what you notice automatically between these two differences, between just having the text there and having it graphically represented. Like, what are some things you like about it? All right, one person said it's more focused topically. Yeah, as soon as you see it, you're like, this is about water. Um, there's color. Yeah, our brains love color, right? Um, water is the main topic. Less effort to process it. That's a big one. Yeah, organizations of the words. It's engaging. It gives character. Oh, I love all of this. You're right. It's all of these things, right? When you encounter something that is graphically set up this way, um, it is engaging. The information is very clear. You know what um, to expect. Uh, it's easier to remember. That is great. Thank you to everybody who took the time to uh, um, say something in the chat. So yeah, this is, this is what you're going to be doing when you create your research poster, right? So you have all that information. You got all the words. You did the work. So how do you transfer it over and be able to say, these are the main points that I want people to know and how do I do it, right? So you're gonna do it by all the things that you just mentioned, organizing the information, using some color um, and making it engaging. These are just the general elements of design. So this is what you're taught in like, Graphic Design 101, right? So these are the things that you will be thinking about when you create your research poster. And the, sim the ones you're gonna focus on the most are gonna be color, size, and space, right? So colors, so what colors do you wanna use? I'm sure all of you are gonna feel pretty beholden to use the University of Utah red, um, but consider other colors that might make sense. So if you're talking about, um, say you're working on biology or botany, say you're working on botany, you might wanna use the color green, um, but say you're talking about um, maybe a more harsh or, or like death rates, you might want to use the color black. If you were talking about, um, I'm trying to think of some of the other, they sent us a list of all your majors and what you'd be working on. So say you're working on like um, more science topics, usually people will use blue for something like that. If you're um, talking about uh, people and conversations and you want things to look really bright and catchy, you might use orange. Um, size. Size, what you're going to be thinking about is um, what are going to be the biggest things, right? What is the biggest thing that you want on your poster? Is it the point you're making? Is it your name? Is it a photograph? Is it a bar chart, right? So think about what needs to be biggest, what needs to be smaller, what needs to be smallest, right? Um, how big do you need a QR code to be on your poster, right? And then space. Space is the area between the pieces, right? So you're gonna have your block of text and you're gonna have a photo 
or a chart, how much space do you want to put between those two? And my, my big thing that I usually tell students is always put more space, put a lot of breathing room, give um, a person's like brain and eyes a break when they're going from one section of your poster to the next, right? When they're reading, give them a minute before they see the graphic part. So let's think about these four things when you go into it. So size, how big is each section? Are the things that are most important bigger, bolder, right? And then fonts, fonts, people love to get creative with fonts, but um, try to stick to only one or two on your research posters and make sure that the font is easy to read, right? So unless you're doing research on like Halloween, maybe don't use chiller font. Um, but if you are doing research on Halloween, go wild, right? Um, color, is the color adding to the poster? Are you using only like two to four colors? And is there cohesion? Like, do the colors make sense together? Um, so like when someone's doing a University of Utah once, they'll usually use white and black and the University of Utah red. And sometimes they'll use like a muted red that's sort of a pink color so that they all sort of work together. Um, I know BYU uses their blue and then they'll use like different shades of blue. Um, and then layout, always more white space, more white space. Give someone reading a break when they're looking at your stuff. Okay, so a lot of you are gonna be doing two different kinds of um, data, right? So in terms of your research, a lot of you are going to be doing quantitative. So you're going to be looking at numbers, statistics, graphs, charts. Um, and some of you are going to be doing qualitative, which have to do more with like anecdotes, stories, displays, photographs. And here's the thing. I know that a lot of uh, qualitative posters, people can get kind of hung up on like, well, I don't have numbers to put in a bar chart. So what do I, what do I do to create something that is like you know, data visualization. The thing is that opens up so many more things that you can include, right? You can have any mix of these kinds of things on your poster to visually depict the information that you gathered as part of your research. So if you're doing something qualitative, right? You can use stock photos, um, you can use displays, you can use um, stories. So you can like have a you know, an icon of a person and have a quote and have something written out in there. Um, same with anecdotes. You can use things like these right here, icons. Icons are great. Um, icons are a shorthand to help our brain let us know what you're about to start talking about. And then with quantitative, that is where you can use all kinds of things. You can use a scatter plot, you can use bar charts, you can use pie charts, you can use donut. Um, these are the, all the different kinds of ways that you can make um statistics look a little more interesting and more visually understandable so next up is greg who's going to be telling you more about the ins and outs of what to use all right um so yes you're gonna hear a little uh um uh, response or um uh, repeating of some of those design principles as i go through my portion of the presentation but uh, i'm going to focus on the practical elements uh, where you can uh, find the tools to make these things happen, where you can find resources, that sort of thing. So the first point that I want to make is that, uh, in my opinion, PowerPoint is the industry standard for creating academic posters. While it was designed for slideshow presentations like the one that you're watching right now, um, it has the ability to create a single slide uh, of uh, a large dimension uh, that can then be uh, exported and printed. Uh, you all have access to uh, Microsoft Office, either on the computers in any of the dorms, in the libraries, in the computer labs on campus. And if you want, you, could, you also uh, have a free subscription to it by going to the university's Office of Software Licensing. Uh, Microsoft does offer some basic online training. If you're not familiar with PowerPoint, there's a link in this uh, uh, slideshow and you will have access to this slideshow. Uh, I, you may have access to it right now and you will certainly have access to it immediately after our presentation. And all of these links uh, will take you to those resources. It is also possible to create posters using some other software uh, design programs. You might need a little more uh, skills uh, in design to use these. Um, two examples that I have up here are InDesign, which is an Adobe product, uh, and Latex, which is actually designed very specifically for uh, scientific uh, presentations. 
Uh, as I said before, it's possible in PowerPoint to create a single slide uh, that is larger, and that's super important for when you're planning to export your PowerPoint slide as a poster. You'll want to go into uh, the, um, let's see, page setup in uh uh, PowerPoint or search in the help menu for resizing uh, the slide size. And you want to then give it the dimensions uh, that your uh, poster presenter uh, organization has set. Uh, standard is three feet by four feet. Um, uh, it may be as small as two by three. Uh, it might be vertical, it might be horizontal. So make sure you know those uh, dimensions. Um, it's also important to know then that when you are working on your poster on your laptop or on a computer, the dimensions are considerably smaller in front of you. So the images will look may look really great on your screen, but when they're blown up three or four, uh, five times their size onto a poster, it's very easy for that image to get pixelated. So when you add images, be sure that you are adding uh, something that can uh, uh, expand out to a larger size. For a JPEG image, you want to make sure that it is at least 300 pixels per inch. And you can check if your source um, uh, image has that resolution by opening it up in a program like Photoshop and then using Photoshop to resize that image. Uh, you have the same access to Adobe software as you do to Microsoft software. It's on all of the computers at the libraries and the computer labs on campus. And you also have a free subscription to the Adobe suite through the Office of Software Licensing. Uh, as Donna mentioned earlier, super important to make sure that your fonts are legible. On your PowerPoint uh, screen, on your computer screen, you want to make sure that the font sizes are relative to one another, but make sure that they are large enough when they get printed out that they'll be legible from about six feet away. I have some recommended sizes uh, here on the slideshow. Uh, anywhere from 85 to 120 point fonts for the main title, 60 to 70 point for headings and maybe 44 to 4, 55 for subheadings and your main body text should be somewhere between 30 to 36 points in order to be legible from about six feet away. And I'm gauging at six feet because that's uh, the distance that somebody might be wandering down the aisle of the poster session and catch an eye and be able to read some of that text and be drawn in. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we have created some templates as starting places for all of you so that you don't have to design from scratch. Um, and we've taken into account the expectations of the uh, Office for Undergraduate Research, where they very specifically state in their review criteria that they want the posters uh, displays to be well organized and professional looking. They want a layout that uh, shows your research efficiently and effectively. The graphic expression should um, uh, be effective in communicating what it's designed to do. The text should be concise. It's not a novel. Uh, it's not an entire uh, research paper. You want to get your uh, reader in and out quickly and make sure that the narrative flow is discernible so that you know where to start uh, and how to flow through uh, that poster presentation. If you want to look at some poster designs, you can go to the link that we have here in one of the uh, Marriott Library campus guides for posters and go to the tab that is labeled the poster top to bottom. And there we have about seven or eight uh, poster templates. You can see two of them on this slide right here in the upper left is what I might refer to as um, traditional or uh, columnar and very text-based uh, poster design. Um, and then in the lower right corner is a brand new design that we uh, offered this semester. Uh, this one is very visually dynamic, engaging, gets a message across to your uh, viewer immediately with that one uh, phrase, uh, one result finding at the top, uh, an image to draw them in, and then some uh, background methodology and discussion information uh, around the perimeter. Next slide, please. 
Um, as Donna mentioned earlier, uh, color conveys meaning and is really important for your choice. So uh, as you're choosing the two or three colors that you're going to include into your poster, uh, you may want to use some resources uh, that will help you identify colors that are complementary to one another, that work well, that don't fight with each other. Uh, we know that you can uh, end up with some very garish colors um, uh, in posters together. If I had all six of these primary colors together, uh, it would look like a carnival rather than a serious research poster. So there are some online tools that you can use to help you choose colors that are complementary to your base color. So uh, in that top of that uh, triangle there, I've got the university crimson red. I could uh, uh, bring up that color in the Adobe color wheel or in the material palette and then uh, have it show me uh, various color combinations that are complementary to that. And once you've selected a color, it's important to identify the hex code number. Uh, I have it shown here on the slide. It's a pound sign with six digits uh, behind it. It is alphanumeric, uh, A through F, and then zero through nine. And those six digits will uniquely identify an exact color that your computer understands. And then you can take that uh, hexadecimal code and embed it into your PowerPoint presentation. You can take an object uh, such as a shape, a circle, uh, a box, or the outline or the background for it. Uh, you can do it for the font, for the text that you have on the screen, you choose to format that particular object and then choose the fill. Uh, it might look like a um, highlighter marker or a bucket of paint pouring out some color. And then you can choose the advanced menu and, uh, or uh, it might say uh, more fill colors, and that's where you'll be able to enter in that six digit number and assign uh, that color to that specific item. It's also important to know that while you are designing on a computer screen, your final product will be printed out. And the human eye perceives colors differently when it is projected from a screen into your eye versus when it bounces off of a surface like uh, a paper poster. So uh, this is why uh, it, it's important to know the difference because when you're designing on your computer screen, what ends up printed on the poster may look a little different. And just for a little background, um, the color uh, system that is used for uh, screen objects is called RGB, which is stands for red, green, blue. It's the, uh, the three light colors that when combined create white uh, versus printing on paper, they use the CMY uh, K combination, um, which is cyan, magenta, yellow, and K stands for black. Uh, and those four colors give you this a broad spectrum of all of the colors, presuming you're printing on white paper. So uh, colors on screen are additive and are projected. Um, colors on a piece of paper are subtractive and they ref it's reflecting off uh, the color. Um, and there are so many more options on your computer screen than there are in uh, the uh, printed style. You only have about 2,000 colors to choose from. That's actually still quite a lot. So um, all of this distilled down, it's important to recognize that the presentation that you're looking at on the screen is going to appear brighter to you while you're designing and will appear darker on the actual printed page. So if you really care about the color that you're seeing in the finished product, I uh, suggest that you print off maybe just an eight and a half by 11 version of your poster to see what the colors look like in real life and then adjust from there. Um, one more point is to think about um, accessibility. There are some people, there are a lot of people who have colorblindness and there's not one style or what type of colorblindness. Some people uh, mix up uh, red and green, other people have red and blue, uh, other people see just shades of uh, gray. Uh, if you want to check whether your poster's colors and, and combinations of colors uh, provide the right contrast, you can take a JPEG screenshot of your uh, poster and run it through the colorblind simulator, and it will uh, show you all the various ways that a colorblind person will see your poster depending on the type of colorblindness they have, and then you can adjust your colors accordingly.
Uh, next slide, please. As Donna said earlier, uh, you can use some uh, data visualizations to communicate your uh, your quantitative uh, information quicker or the qualitative uh, information. And the libraries provide a lot of tools for you to be able to do this. Um, uh, and there are a lot of online resources as well. So if you want to create your own data visualizations, here are some tools that I recommend. Uh, the first one, Visualizing Data, is actually a website or a repository of other resources around the web. Um, it's updated occasionally. Some of these are, are um, uh Fly by night uh, uh, tools. They're created, they're online for six months and gone again. So some of the um, links in the visualizing data may be out of date, but a lot of them are still active and are still a good resource for you. Caveat mTOR, recognize that some of these free tools uh, may have uh, reasons why they're free. They either limit some of the options or they uh, force you to have a branded watermark on uh, the output. Uh, object, um, and you may have to pay a small fee in order to remove those uh, those limitations. But for the most part, lots of free, useful stuff. Some of them that I really like and I highly recommend include raw graphs. And if you look at the bottom of my slide here, those five images were all exported using the raw graphs tool. It's completely free. You can upload structured data. So if you have a dot a CSV file, uh, you can upload that into raw graphs and uh, start manipulating your data and export a wide variety of bar graphs, line graphs, uh, uh, scatters, plots, um, timelines, that sort of thing. Um, BioRender, which is the link in the lower right corner there, uh, is a new tool that's uh, new to me. Uh, it's uh, free for educational use and a fantastic sort of drag and drop design your own icons within the life sciences. So really great for a lot of you science students out there. Tableau, uh, Public, and ArcGIS uh, do have some free uh, elements to them. They are very powerful tools, but they do require some training in order to use them effectively and understand uh, uh, the ins and outs. If you come to the Marriott Library, we have staff who are employed here who can take you through some of these resources, uh, these employees uh, work primarily out of Protospace and the Digital Matters Lab. So come and, come down to Marriott Library and uh, ask to talk to those individuals or schedule a consultation. You can always reach out to me and I can connect you with those people. Uh, and then the last one on the screen is uh, Webplot Digitizer. Really great uh, for, again, science uh, and data-driven um, visualizations. I do not have experience with the tool, but there is a video uh, about it that we will uh, talk about at the end of our presentation here today. So next slide, please. You can also find some ready-made images uh, and graphics. The uh, university libraries subscribe to over 300 research databases even research articles uh, that are uh, text heavy will have some graphics, some data visualizations in them. You can pull those uh, out of the database and uh, perhaps incorporate them into your presentation if the research was used, uh, if, if that particular article or um, uh, publication was used in your own research. Um, uh, some examples that we have here that are very visually rich are uh, popular magazines, uh, a database called Birds of the World, for those of you who are into ornithology, um, JSTOR and ArtStore are two public, uh, two online resources that the library subscribe to that have millions absolutely millions of uh, visual objects in them. Uh, some that are more science oriented uh, might include anatomy.tv and the Imaging Reference Center. Go to the database uh, URL that I, I have here, choose to view the databases by type, and then choose the subcategory of images and you will get a ton of stuff. Just remember, that uh, when you pull an object out of one of those databases, you always want to give credit, uh, whether that object was free in public domain or if it's covered uh, under copyright. You can use it for your poster presentation for educational and research purposes, but you always want to give credit where credit is due. Next slide, please. 
Um, along those same lines, um, there are places where you can go out on the open web and find good content. I have a number of them linked from my visual communication guide. There's a link there. Uh, uh, to my guide and go to the tab called Finding Images. Once again, if you find something out on the web, no matter where you find it, through Google Images or through some of the resources that I recommend, you must always give credit uh, to the individual link to a URL so that other people can find that particular object and don't claim it as your own. Um, some really great options here include the Noun Project. If you're looking for iconography that you can pull out, uh, they uh, are available in a black and white format, and then you can recolor them inside of your PowerPoint slideshow. Uh, the last option there, bio render, is uh, a, a new one to me. Uh, 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 I, I think I mentioned it earlier with the drag and drop uh, uh, feature, but now you see sort of uh, the color and the style of the um, icons that you can create using that tool. Okay, um, we are now going to move into the next phase, which is interactive, uh, and we are going to start critiquing some posters. Donna and I will talk you through the process, but we will start asking you to interact with us. So get ready to turn on your microphones and share, uh, as well as uh, posting things in the chat, and we'll read those into the record here. So uh, Donna, if you would, jump to that live website. All right, All right. let's scroll let's scroll down, down a little bit. Uh, to the first side-by-side -side comparison. That's the one. So um, some of the things that Donna was talking about uh, earlier about uh, the graphic design principles are very well illustrated here. On the left-hand side, we have a fairly traditional poster, almost looks like a, a research journal article. It's got a big banner uh, title on the top, Tons of text, almost no white space, and a couple of uh, uh, graphs in the middle of that versus the same sort of uh, idea as far as a poster is concerned on the right hand side. We've got lovely uh, engaging color. First of all, we have a QR code in the upper right hand corner that probably takes uh, the viewer to the heavy, uh, uh, well-documented website with all of the research data and a full write-up, uh, maybe even a published article uh, about this particular research. It's got lots of white space. Notice white space doesn't have to be white. It can just be a neutral background color. Uh, it's just uh, sort of breathing room for the various objects that are included in your poster. So let's uh, let's go down to uh, the first example that they have of a research poster. Uh, and Donna, why don't you talk through what you're seeing um, here, where it's the real research poster, and then on the on the left and on the right hand side, it's been broken down to the various elements, and and then we can do a little critique of our own, and then have the students do the next one. Absolutely. So. If you're looking at this, so these are done in more of a vertical style than a horizontal style. The majority of you will probably be doing more horizontal posters. But in the case of this poster, you can see right at the top, you have the logo for the university and then a title. And then after that, it actually has a comic. So they put together a comic to try and show in a more um, funny way what they were doing. Um, in terms of their science, as if it were James Bond. Um, you know, a James Bond villain going after, um, I think these are supposed to be like cells. Uh, and then much smaller in the, in the, in the bottom half, you have um, background methods, results, um, you've got bar charts, you've got some kind of like research imaging right here. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why, because I haven't read, but there's a little worm ending with a conclusion. And then down at the bottom, you've got references, acknowledgements, more logos probably of everybody who was involved in this um and so i would I, you know part of the reason why i like this it's very graphical right like i'd love that there's so much to look at that isn't text um comics i think are incredible ways to present information uh and make um really difficult topics really easy to take in you know, through, um, if you're interested, graphic medicine is a very cool way to present um, health information, especially from the patient perspective using comics. Um, and then uh, the rest of this, like the, the, the blues, the sort of coral pink reds being used, 
um, the different bar charts are using like a whole different range of colors. And I wonder if like with these two charts, if the colors correspond to the same thing or not. Um, and then that the results are sort of in this like double, double, they're like on both sides, but conclusion sort of right here. So I like it. I think this is fun. Uh, but I do think there's some that can be improved in terms of um, readability or legibility. Why don't we go ahead and slide to the next side-by-side -side comparison. And uh, we're going to ask for all of you uh, in uh, chat or feel free to turn on your uh, microphone to start doing a similar breakdown. Think about the design principles uh, that Donna and I have talked about with regard to uh, font and size and color and shape and direction and white space and those sorts of things. And I would love for you to tell us uh, what you're seeing on this particular poster that's working well. Lots of people uh, focusing on the color. Uh, and I want um, the thing that, uh, yes, exactly. There we go. Uh, Sienna says, uh, I like that the color scheme is drawn from the bird picture. And that's exactly right. Now we have complementary colors. Uh, the focus is on the wild zebra finch. Really great choice to choose the browns, the orange, and the black, uh, and and sort of a mid-tone gray from the head. And all of those become uh, the the colors that are used throughout the rest of the poster. Fantastic. Yeah. What other things are you seeing, Donna, here? All right. So Mary Hall pointed out that there's good white space, interesting birds, and it's directional. Directional is a really interesting one that you pointed out that um, I don't know how much we've talked about it, but yeah, that you start with the title up at the top. And then looking at the bird, it's sort of pointing you towards all of the information, right? Like if you follow it, it, it it's curving towards the words. And then you make your way down and you read the rest of it. And, and so it's organized and it's directional and you know exactly where to go to get the next piece, next piece of information. Yeah, there's even like a dotted line that's sort of uh, connect the dots, sort of leading your eye. And this really fits in well with uh, the criterion that, uh, that the undergraduate research uh, folks placed, uh, mentioned in how they review posters, which is that legibility and, and the flow, being able to understand uh, where the eye should travel to read the information in the right order. So this really uh, fits that well. Great. Um, should we do one more on this website? And then we'll flip over to some real posters from uh, your peers, previous uh, uh, OUR poster presenters. All so right. here's another one. Um, and uh, I think there are a lot of great things in this poster, but what I would like you to comment on this time is what is not working well in this poster? What could be improved if you had the opportunity to revise this poster? What would you focus on changing? Text size. Keep in mind, of course, this is on your screen is probably about eight inches tall rather than, you know, uh, four feet tall. But yes, uh, the, the font size might be a little small there. Uh, the background color, very dark. That might make it hard for the other colors to stand off the background. So that's certainly a consideration. Although if we uh, really liked the idea of using the colors from the finch, uh, they've used the same idea here of the yellow, green, and the black uh, off of this particular crab. Um, but yes, uh, it might be possible to take that, that black and turn it into a gray so that it's not so harsh. Uh, that's a possibility. Um, uh, Emily is saying, and a couple other folks have mentioned that it feels sort of cluttered. So maybe there's not enough white space around uh, everything. And it's entirely possible the black color is also making it feel cluttered. Um, somebody suggested flipping the color scheme. So maybe you would have the yellow as the background and use black and green and gray as, as uh, the front colors. Great. Uh, there's a confusing flow. I will say that this person made an attempt at showing the flow. If you look at the yellow subtitle Sorry. banners, they have a little arrow point on the right side, sort of pointing you to go across. But yes, uh, it is not a natural read of this particular poster to read from uh, upper left to upper right to middle left to middle right to lower left to lower right. Uh, it it uh, That might be how we read on page, but when we have that center divider, it's, it's confusing as to where the eye should go next. Should it read all the way down the first column and then the second column 
or uh, left or right all the way across. So great. Those are things that I would look at to change and how I might critique this particular poster. Why don't we go back to our slideshow and we are going to be presenting you with some uh, photographs of posters from February's Euchre conference. Um, I took these photos when I came through um, uh, the three or four sessions that were uh, held in February. I did get the presenter's consent to take the photos, but we have blurred out identifying photos of the individuals um, because we want you to focus on the posters themselves. So here we have two side-by-side -side, uh, posters, obviously pulled from the same template. But they are there. Uh, each of them has some different elements that the uh, designers have chosen to add or take away. And I'm interested to hear what you are seeing uh, in uh, the differences between these posters, for good or for bad. Yeah, the first comment is the first thing I thought, or the first two comments that it really helps to have that large photo um, for the one on the right. And let me ask a follow up question. What is it about that big picture? What what is it doing? Um, is it is it telling a story? Is it uh, what are the benefits? There we go. That's uh, of having a large image like that. So um, uh, uh, poster number thirty. Oh, <laughs> uh, Alondra has already sort of responded to that, saying the big picture represents the topic. Very quickly, I don't have to read a single word. I can already see uh, the LDS temple in Salt Lake City. I can see a pride flag. I can see people uh, milling about, perhaps marching, and I already have an idea of uh, the context of this particular poster instantly within one second. Uh, other things that I'm seeing in this particular poster. Uh, oh, yeah. Thank you, Olivia. Yes. An image like that catches your attention from a far away and draws in the person to have a conversation with the poster presenter to get them to start reading more. That big title gives you uh, a, a big draw. And then when they come in about six feet away, they're able to read all of the rest of that text. Um, uh, Levi uh, says, or Levy uh, says that the poster on the right has a clear title that gives context to the poster while the poster on the left ends up being slightly vague. So choosing that highlight, that, that, uh, that uh, phrase that you're going to put if you choose to have this big uh, banner, is it a title? Is it uh, a uh, caption? Is it a quote from, uh, from somebody that you talked to and interviewed? Is it uh, your key research finding uh, really uh, all different choices and all could have uh, pros and cons? So why don't we move on to the next uh, image? Uh, by the way, Emily just pointed out that they have a QR code with more information. So it isn't yes. all cluttered. Oh, which is... fantastic. Great idea. Yeah. And it and it even says there, you know, scan here to see the survey and read more information about our research team. So we don't have to cover it all in the poster. We can lead people to a website if they really are interested in our topic. Fantastic. Good eye, Emily. So we have two more side-by-side -side posters. The one on the left looks like it had a very similar template, maybe the identical template uh, to the previous ones. And then the one on the right, uh, entirely different template. Um, let us know what you're seeing that you like about these posters or things that you, if you had the opportunity to revise them, would change um, for the left or for the right. On the right, I would definitely reduce the amount of text given, said Paulina. Uh, the right could use headers to separate the info better. Really squished spacing. <laughs> right one, the font is too small. It's overwhelming. Um, I re uh, let's see. Multi I really like how the images on the left can give a good idea about the topic. Yeah, the, the text on the poster on the right is... Um, it definitely gives the impression that they took their entire abstract and just copy and pasted it into a column um, while trying to just create a really big explainer in the middle. Um, but even that, that explainer almost seems a little too long as well. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if you look at it, it's two full sentences versus a blurb or a, a single sentence at most. Yeah. Uh, Landra makes note uh, that the uh, U of U icon seems uh, small. I presume we're talking about the one on the right-hand side. Uh, 
Um, I want to point out some things that I uh, like about the one on the left. One, uh, they added that extra gray banner across the top. Not necessary in all posters, but I like the fact that uh, it says business because I first look at this poster and I think it's going to be about architecture or engineering. And this person is saying, nope, this is a business look at some construction uh, related research. So uh, it's really uh, a great way of clarifying uh, the context for the images and the content that we're seeing on the screen. Um, let me see one student. Let me see who was it. Abril said bullet points. Love those. Yes. We had a question um, in last time we taught this class where someone uh, just generally asked, like, how do I make my words um, like more brief? How do I condense all of this into something that is like fewer words and one of the easiest ways that you can do that is just use bullet points just bullet point the main things that you need to say and that will automatically cut down on words and it will separate the ideas why don't we move on to the next slide i'm going to keep an eye on time we've got about 10 minutes so we'll do a few more of these so uh, the Euchre conference was uh, statewide. So we had students coming from uh, all uh, institutions all around the state. Here's an example from a student at BYU. We know that because they have the BYU, BYU logo right there in the upper left-hand corner. Um, uh, tell us what you're seeing on this particular poster. What are some things uh, that you like? Are there any of the elements uh, that we've talked about that we're stressing to help with the visual presentation that are happening here in this poster? Poster. Let's see. I, um, Paulina said, I honestly like the poster. The subtitles and images give me an impression of uh, what I'll listen to. Um, I like that they added pictures, but the picture isn't really telling me what this is about. Um, the use of icons. Yeah, I do like the use of icons in this actually a lot and the use of color. I also think that um, given a horizontal poster and the ability to figure out the navigation, which way does the information flow? I think this one works beautifully. We have the abstract in the upper left. That's the natural place for us to uh, read as uh, English speakers. And uh, we go top to bottom. So we go abstract to pro. And because of that center image, we have no choice but to continue going uh, across uh, the bottom. So we know precisely where to go all the way over to cons. And then the last place that we haven't seen yet on the poster is going up to the conclusion. So that's a really nice flow. It is not the most logical way. It's not the way that I have ever done in a poster, but I think it's very effective. Okay, let's go on to the next poster. So this one is from uh, Utah State. If we get through more slides, you'll see uh, other presenters who have a similar layout. Um, what are some things that we haven't heard you comment on yet that uh, are unique about this particular poster that, uh, are, that, that are really working for this poster? So uh, Mauro uh, Gonzalez says effective use of a map. There we have uh, the shape of the state of Utah and within it, there are icons uh, showing flames. I immediately know that we're talking about wildfires uh, in the state of Utah. Fantastic, great, yep, instant read on that one. Um, highlighting uh, and contrasting color on the most important words in that banner. That really stands out for me, small culverts, at risk. It's like a sentence within a sentence or a phrase within another phrase, right? It's it's uh, wonderfully designed in that particular case. And the colors are complementary. We have a dark blue background. We have the light blue for highlight and then white text. And they use that same light blue as headers when they're on the white background. So it's a really nice use of just three colors to uh, give us a cohesive layout. Yeah, speaking of the colors, I also like that the orange from the flames is the same as the blue and orange that's being used on the graphs over here as well. Right. Um, Bethany mentions there's a lot of pictures and not much description here. So we have um, we have photo documentation of the research uh, this of uh, how this person is developing or um, uh, doing their research and it's engaging. It draws us in that big middle really draws us in. And the point of a poster session, 
really is to have a conversation with the researcher. They're giving you just enough information for you to read it through quickly, and then you can follow up with additional questions uh, to find out more about, uh, you know, uh, uh, what additional findings did they have, what challenges did they have, that sort of thing. I would say this is a near-perfect poster. The only thing that's missing, and maybe it's behind uh, uh, the person standing in the suit, but there's no QR code taking us to uh, the full development of the research in a website. But honestly, I think this is a near-perfect poster as far as uh, my criteria is concerned. So I agree. let's move on to the next one. Uh, and this will be our last one. So <laughs> uh, now that I've mentioned the QR code, we chose this one to, to include in here. Uh, just uh, think about uh, your choice and what is the focus. These folks went to perhaps the extreme and thought, uh, you just want to read our heavy duty research and see our entire website. So we're going to give you this QR code. Um, I would maybe have chosen a, um, a a representative image of the research in this uh, spot and then put the QR code down in the right hand uh, column. So why don't we uh, flip past the rest of our poster presentations and finish up our slideshow um, uh, with uh, the remaining information that we have. Just a quick one, really love this one with the use of the background of the monstera leaves. Well, I'll say um, when you get our slideshow uh, and review it, you can look in the speaker's notes and we have a couple of comments on each of those slides so you can uh, review that. Um, for those of you who are interested in doing a multimedia presentation for your uh, for your poster, if you want to add uh, video content um, uh, or audio content, and this was actually an option uh, when the posters were being presented online, the Marriott Library has some dedicated recording booths uh, and studios. You can find links and information uh, on this particular slide. Uh, you can schedule uh, this booth that I'm in right here. This is the Simple Video Studio. It's set up to just put in a flash drive to turn on all of the equipment. Uh, you press two or three buttons. It begins the recording. When you're done, you press one more to end it, and it exports uh, a, uh, a movie file that you can upload immediately into uh, YouTube or Vimeo or uh, do some post-editing if you want to extract out the, the audio content or add uh, top and tail to it, you know, a, 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 a header to it and, and credits at the end of it. So uh, really easy to use. Uh, Eccles Library has uh, moved to a checkout system where they have AV kits where you can check out cameras and microphones, uh, those are available for those of you who are on the upper campus. But really, all of this is, equipment is available to any student at the university. You don't have to be a part of the medical campus or the lower campus in either case. And this is just a link. If you wanted to go look at all of the posters from last year's um, groups to kind of see what you like and what you didn't like from all of them, you are welcome to go look at all of those. And all of these links will be available when we um, upload this. All of these are clickable. Um, and I think some of them might have already been made available to you. So one quick comment. I said earlier in my presentation that there was sort of a, a very scientific oriented data visualization tool. This video here, this education tool uh, with uh, Dr. Sparks. Uh, Dr. Sparks is the one who introduced us to that tool and can provide you with more information about utilizing that data visualization tool. All right, so any questions in the last couple minutes here that you have for me or Greg. And, and while these you're are just links those, to make uh, appointments with either of us. If you want us to actually sit down one-to-one -one and look over your research clusters, we are both happy to do that. Yeah, that's exactly right. These links will take you directly into our calendars and will show you what hour-long periods we have available for consultations. All right, any questions? All of the links are in the slideshow. So when you go through the slideshow, you can actually click the links and they should, I think Shelly already put the link to the slides. Um, in the chat. Great, and You're we, have a, we have a comment from Bethany. One issue uh, that I have with the QR codes is that whoever scans it now has complete access to your data. Well, you get to choose what 
you put on that particular website. The QR code is there as an effective way of bringing people either to a duplicate copy of your poster. That could be the end result. It could take them to a website that merely provides them with background information on all of the researchers who were involved. It could take them to a citation, a complete citation list. Like here are all of the articles that I use. You don't have to put in all of your data on that particular web page or website. You get to decide what goes there. The QR code is just a really easy graphical way of getting them to that page. They can bring up their phone. Everyone does it now. Instead of typing in a URL, they just use the QR code and they're, and they're off running. So Aaliyah asks, is it normal? normal to add QR codes. I would say it wasn't until about a year ago. And now it is very much like expected um, that QR codes are put on posters. A lot of us who present at academic conferences like myself and Greg, um, the conference itself will create QR codes for every single poster and they'll send you yours. And that way, when someone is visiting it, it will take them to a page with say a digital version of your poster, maybe some more information, maybe some handouts that's on like the conference webpage. So yeah. yes, they are very normal to be on there. Yeah. But the caveat again is if you don't have additional information, if you, if, if the poster is complete for what you want to share with your reader, you don't need a QR code, but it is it is handy for taking somebody to a copy of your poster if you want them to be able to access that digital file at minimum. So we're we are now at a, a full hour. Um, I'm going to leave it with uh, you have our contact information in this slideshow. You have links to our calendars where you can schedule consultations. If you have more questions, please feel free to follow up with us directly through email or by scheduling a consultation. And we'll turn it back over to Shelley to close out the event. Thank you, Donna and Greg, for an amazing presentation as, al as always. Um, I just want to remind everybody about the evaluation form. I, I am putting the link in the chat right now, or you can scan this QR code. Um, just a reminder, you're up and Spur Scholars must fill this out, this evaluation out to receive credit for attending the event. And next slide, just want to remind everybody about um, OUR. Um, we're at our.utah.edu. You can email us at our.utah.edu or give us a call at 801-581-8070. So thank you very much for attending and thank you, Greg and Donna for presenting.